which will be immediately I followed by our praise. Rise and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem, which will be immediately I followed by our praise. Rise and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem, which will be immediately I followed by our Welcome to this year's Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lecture 2022, A Filipino Perspective of Heroism and Valor. I am Felici Lois Lanya. And I am Maga Grace Tahazun, and we are your hosts for today. Now, before anything else, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following. Department of National Defense Secretary Delphine and Lorenzana. PIVAO Administrator Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina. PIVAO Deputy Administrator. Uh, Asik Rauzi Caballes, NHTP Chairperson Dr. Rene Escalante, PVB Vice President Mr. Mike Villarreal, Mount Samat FDES Administrator Mr. Francis Initorio, VSP President Dr. Cesar P. Pobre, Dr. Archie B. Rezos from the University of Santo Tomas, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez from the De La Salle University, and Dr. Marilyn R. Ngales from the Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila. Also, we would like to extend our gratitude to the following institutions for partnering with us in this webinar series. Armed Forces of the Philippines OJ3, Department of Education, Commission on Higher Education, Department of Tourism, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Youth Commission, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Veterans Federation of the Philippines, Philippine Information Agency, Girl Scouts of the Philippines, Boy Scouts of the Philippines, Filipino American Memorial Endowment, Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor Incorporated. Right now, we have about 105 participants here in Zoom, and for those who are unable to pre-register, we are currently being broadcasted via Facebook Live 
on the official Facebook page of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. Now, before we officially begin the program, here are some reminders for all of us. In case there are labs, just stay on and wait for it to load again. Zoom attendees are on mute to avoid background noise. Now, if you have questions, you may use the message box for Zoom attendees or use the comment section on the Facebook live stream. Now, after the webinar, the participants who registered in this webinar are encouraged to answer the evaluation form. The link will be sent to your email. Now, for our recap, during our last episode, we were joined by our four resource speakers. First, by Dr. Angelita Damili, who discussed the life and the important contributions of Jose P. Laurel and his legacy during the occupation, followed by Mr. Roman Sarmiento, who explained to us the little-known aspect, aspect of the war, the epidemic during the Japanese occupation. During afternoon session, Dr. Jose Victor Torres gave us a glimpse of the city of Manila at the outbreak of the World War II on the, in the Philippines. Meanwhile, a lecture on the Filipino and Japanese representations in World War II parades in the Philippines was elaborated by Mr. Jose Lito Everett. Now, for those of you who wish to watch the previous episode of our webinar series, the recorded lectures may still be viewed at the official Facebook page and YouTube account of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. Our lineup of our research speakers for this morning's session include Dr. Ray Carlos P. Gonzalez, who will be talking about the Ilongo ingenuity in World War II Panay, and Mr. Modesto Saonoy, who will be narrating to us the Battle of Patag and Lantawan, one of the bloodiest battles in the Philippine history. And finally, for our afternoon session, we will be joined by Dr. Earl Jude Cleope, who will share the interesting story of the Jungle University 1942 to 1945, Seliman University, during the Japanese occupation in Negros Island. So without further ado, let us begin our program with an opening message from the chairperson of the Department of International Studies, Far Eastern University, Mr. Francis M. Esteban. Good morning. I'd like to congratulate the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office for the successful launch of this year's Gantingan webinar series. Today marks another relevant discussion of our history, and it's truly really exciting to hear from our guest speakers. I invite everyone to share the lessons of history that they will learn in today's activity to their respective communities, families, and friends. It's very important that we do so especially now that we are in a crucial juncture of our election season. Let us stand firm with the truth. Let's stand firm with the truth in our history. And may the events or may events like this shed light and inspiration to all. Once again, congratulations to the organizers. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Esteban, for your welcoming message. First in the lineup of our speakers for today is a history professor from the University of the Philippines, Dr. Ray Carlos C. Gonzalez. Ampoy Gonzalez is a faculty of history at the University of the Philippines, Visayas. He finished his BA history at the University of Philippines, Visayas his MA history at the University of the Philippines de Laman, and his PhD history at the University of Manchester. His fields of specialization are World War II Panay, national identity, and nationalism. His fields of interest include world history, military history, ancient civilizations, and world religion. Apart from teaching, he currently serves as the director of alumni relations at the University of the Philippines and is an AFP reservist under the 502nd Task Group of Panay. He has studied Filipino martial arts since 2005 and occasionally gives free classes in Filipino martial arts to interested students. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ray Carlo P. Gonzalez. Hello, everyone. My name is Ompoy Gonzalez. Hello. I'm a faculty of history at UPV, and I've been fascinated with the subject of World War II since I was eight years old. 
Over the years, my research has taken me towards a more in-depth look at the course of the war on the island of Panay. I had the honor of meeting people, soldiers, civilians, and secondhand witnesses to one of the most definitive periods in our nation's history. One of the most lasting realizations I learned was that the war was certainly more than just the military developments that occurred over the period of 1941 to 1945. The war was wrapped by other things like cultural, economic, and social developments, which, at the very least, provided context for other aspects, such as the military developments, which I was more interested in. In this particular lecture, I explore a phenomenon in remembering the war. This particular phenomenon perceives the Ilongos as a disadvantaged group of people, at least compared to, say, the Japanese or the Americans, but who, nevertheless, by sheer ingenuity, overcame the limitations that fate so unkindly handed to them. The ability to do so has been dubbed by Panay guerrillas as Ilongo disponering. To begin, we attempt to define the word. Disponering is an amalgamation, a portmanteau, if you will, of the Spanish word disponer, meaning to provide, and the English word engineering. If any, it is a playful hiligaynon combination of two cultural elements from two of Philippine history's colonial masters. Roughly, as the images on the slide show, to disponer is understood as to be able to make do of whatever is available in order to provide creative solutions to immediate problems. The use of disponer implies some sort of impromptu improvisation, which is offset by the principle of engineering, which suggests a working and more carefully thought of system. Oftentimes, when Ilongos find themselves with problems that are nearly impossible to solve, they would surrender to fate, almost with a bahalana kind of attitude, and comfort the worried by saying, Madisponiran gid ina. We can't really seem to pin a date of origin for the concept of disponer. It is still something that is commonly used today. By far, the earliest I was able to encounter its use in Iloilo makes a reference to the Commonwealth era, especially when Filipino Yusefe soldiers were comparing their supplies with their American counterparts. Throughout the war, even among civilians who were in hiding from the conflict, it seemed to be a common solution to, at the very least, attain some semblance of normalcy in their lives, which had been intermittently interrupted by various tragedies. We thus ask ourselves at this point, and we will hang on to this question, how the principle of disponering appears among the narratives about the war in Panay. This lecture uses theories in oral history made by Raphael Samuel and Paul Thompson in their 1990 book, The Myths We Live By. For the most part, the authors argue that the use of narratives, such as the ones we are examining in this lecture, are formed and structured ways by which people could make sense of their pasts in relation to their recollection or retelling in the present. In other words, I argue that narratives about disponering were fixed within the context of the encounter of Filipinos, more specifically in this case, Ilongos, with other nationalities during the war, particularly the Americans and the Japanese. Retelling stories about disponering, therefore, allowed Ilongos to cognitively position themselves and their capacities as colonized or occupied people in the midst of this global conflict. Let us now look at the specific examples which I have encountered over the years in the course of my research on World War II in Panay. 
In April of 1942, upon the defeat of the main body of Filipino and American forces in Bataan, the Japanese turned their sights on the island of Panay. On April 16, they landed at three points on the island, mainly poising to strike at key urban areas, especially at the island's capital of Iloilo City. Defending against them were the Yusufi forces of the 6th Military District, or 6th MD, under Brigadier General Albert Christie. There was no question about the military superiority of the Japanese at this point. Despite a slight numerical disadvantage, the Japanese were well-equipped and modern. They controlled the air and the sea. The soldiers of the 6th MD, on the other hand, had been downsized. Two better organized regiments out of five regiments were sent to defend Mindanao, thus leaving Panay to be defended by three hastily assembled regiments. To make matters worse, what would have been their more decent artillery sunk to the bottom of Manila Bay when the SS Corredor hit a water mine in December of the previous year. Almost simultaneously with the sinking of the SS Corregidor, Fort San Pedro, which housed the soldiers of Panay, Guimaras, and Romblon as they were being assembled, was bombed by 36 twin-engine Japanese planes, reducing it to a woefully despicable pile of rubble. Asymmetric warfare was thus going to be the playbook of the use of a on the island, which they used to great effect. What the soldiers could stock, they commandeered, much to the despair of the locals. What they couldn't lift, they torched under a scorched earth policy. The soldiers lined up the invasion routes with obstacles, booby traps, and ambusades, which were reminiscent of a military strategy known as the falling line. The principle of the falling line was that a defending army would draw up several defensive, but ultimately weaker lines formed in a series of layers whose main objective was to test the patience and determination of the enemy advance. The soldiers felled trees on the roads, which could serve as choke points or ambush points. They strapped explosives to bridges, and when they ran out of explosives, they used sledgehammers. Oftentimes, they would leave a bridge barely intact, such that it would collapse the moment the enemy tried to cross it. For example, fixed positions provided overwatch to stop infantry from securing a bridge. The moment an enemy tank would try to punch through, the Yusufay would either detonate the bridge or its foundations would give way. At least that was the principle, and to some extent it worked. For several days, the soldiers resorted to this strategy, forcing the Japanese advance to grind to crawl. From running battles in the midst of the opulent houses of Haro, the Yusufi soldiers kept harassing the Japanese until they reached the foot of Mount Baloy, where the HQ of the 6th MD was positioned. At that point, it was going to be all or nothing. Ultimately, the stubborn resistance of soldiers under the command of Julian Chavez, seen there in the middle of the slide in a photo taken in 1945, was the one that saved the collapse of the 6th MD. At this point, the Japanese had exhausted their momentum and overstretched their advance. It was a fortuitous development because Chavez's defense was actually the last ditch effort to stall the Japanese war machine. Moving on, we also look at the solution of the 6th MD under Colonel Macario Peralta and the civil government in hiding under Governor Tomas Confesor to the problem of money. Where the nation's banks had ceased printing money in favor of what would eventually be known as Japanese Mickey Mouse money, the military, which had by now refused to surrender alongside their Ameri the Americans after Corregidor, and the provincial government of the island printed their own money. They used these emergency notes as ways to pay soldiers and public servants, and also to procure war material from civilians with the promise that these official IOUs would be paid 
after the end of the war. A close examination of the text will show the words, the Philippine National Bank will pay the bearer on demand the amount indicated in the emergency note. One of the most intriguing and critical innovations during the course of the war was when fuel was eventually manufactured from coconut wine, which is locally known as tuba. Since the start of the war, fuel, which was in short supply, was listed as an important resource. Military logistics and maneuvers relied on the availability of fuel. Moreover, the signal company's equipment could not operate without it. At this point, the signal company under Captain Amos Francia had been desperately trying to reestablish a connection with Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific area. There was no way for the Panay guerrillas to let MacArthur know that they were still intact, effective, and they were giving the Japanese forces a run for their money. Their one greatest hindrance, however, was a lack of weapons and ammunition. This, they prayed, would be supplied to them in Panay. Lieutenant Homero Villasas, a chemistry graduate from UP Diliman, who served in the chemical warfare section of the 6th MD, was the one who was finally able to power the signal company's outpost with fuel distilled from tuba. Much to the sorrow of Aklan's drinking public, the popular drink was thereafter declared as a precious war commodity, and the locals were banned from drinking it. This development, however, was probably the one most important development which turned the tide of the war in Panay. Free Panay Calling, Free Panay Calling was broadcasted in Morse code and was heard all the way in San Francisco. After meticulous security checks and a personal message sent by Peralta himself, MacArthur, who was based in Australia, arranged for submarine supply runs to the island of Panay. Not to be outdone, another unit of the 6th Military District, the Corps of Engineers, under the noses of the Japanese, managed to discreetly carve out an airstrip in the town of Tumaro, which, much closer to the war's end, served as another supply lifeline for the Panay guerrillas. It was modest as far as airstrips went, but that achievement equipped central Panay forces with material to be used on offensives in Iloilo. Again, with reference to the principle of asymmetric warfare, the Yusefe, later the Panay guerrillas, waged war in what the Japanese labeled as the Fourth Front, Hearts and Minds. Four newspapers counteracted Japanese propaganda based in Iloilo City. These newspapers were the civil government's Tigbatas under Abe Gonzalez, the Mount Baloy Watchman under Lieutenant Juan Razo, the Liberator under Captain Jose Nava, and the Flash under Lieutenants Rex Drillon and Jose Guevara. For the most part, these newspapers were freely able to publish during the duration of the conflict. Moreover, at the start of the conflict, Yusuf soldiers were able to mount billboards, such as the one you see on the slide, which demonized the Japanese soldiers. You can probably imagine how the triumphant entry of the victorious Japanese to the urban centers were ruined by such images. When the Corps of Engineers were able to activate the airstrip and equipment began coming in from American airplanes, soldiers serving under the transportation section were able to solve logistical concerns simply by reactivating the Panay Railway, which ran from Dumarao to Iloilo. This ensured that supplies would be able to be distributed to field units in large quantities. One of the most exciting accounts of rendezvous with the Americans occurred after the communication linkage was established by the signal company with units based in Australia. 
Supply runs were promised in the form of submarine drop-offs. Pandan Bay in Antique was one of the more suitable locations for such operations. In the absence of a decent working port, the Panay guerrillas rode out in droves to meet the submarines in the high seas. One such encounter, worthy of having its own action film, almost ended in disaster for the Allied forces when a Japanese patrol boat interrupted the delivery of supplies by the U.S. submarine Narwhal. In the midst of offloading crates from the submarine to the paddle boats, a Japanese patrol boat shone its spotlight on the surprised Filipinos and Americans who promptly jettisoned their cargo. The Narwhal, with its hatch still open, pursued to destroy the patrol boat before it could alert Japanese forces to its discovery. The Narwhal incident is one of the very few examples of a surface encounter by a submarine to a surface vessel. One of the characteristics that defines guerrillas is their ability to disappear into a crowd of civilians. It is mainly a source of strength. The Panay guerrillas, on the other hand, made a name for themselves when they decided to make their own uniforms from abaca and coconut fiber, shown on the right side in the slide. Apologies for the dad joke, but I just couldn't resist. In many ways, this act was a statement from the Panay guerrillas on how they perceived themselves as a regular force which only employs guerrilla tactics. This too serves as a testament to the level of organization of the 6th MD in that they made a conscious effort to equip their soldiers with a distinguishing uniform to set themselves apart from the local population. You can probably imagine that in the middle of an encounter, it was as if they were announcing their dignity. They were not some armed ragtag band, but soldiers of the Philippine Commonwealth. That said, this uniform might just officially be the itchiest military wear of the 20th century. The 6th MD had a unit in charge of ordnance, with no new weapons and ammo coming in because of the Japanese occupation. The ordnance section resorted to making their own firearm repairs, producing gunpowder, and secretly with the help of some foundries in Molo in Iloilo City, the 6th MD manufactured their own grenades, which were rectangular in shape so as not to arouse Japanese suspicions when these had to be smuggled out of the city. In place of the usual leaves for r, &R the Panay guerrillas instead timed their leaves with town and barangay fiestas. They also often organized makeshift balls or bailes, which were known as six to six, named after the fact that these dances lasted from 1800 hours to 0600 hours of the following day. The fiestas and six to six balls were more than just an avenue for recreation. They were in fact very political in as much as formal balls were organized by politicians in hotels or clubs in the city. They became opportunities for the soldiers to meet the local leaders and the populace in more relaxed and cordial settings. There were also ways by which the 6th MD assured the civilian population of their continued existence and were thus a form of propaganda in this manner. The Japanese, meanwhile, were doing similar things in the occupied areas. During the six to six balls, it would be common to find an amakan made from woven bamboo, or this is sawali in Tagalog. These amakan would serve as the dancing area with modest lighting and an impromptu band of anyone who could play the guitar, banjo, violin, or trumpet. The six to six balls were the guerrilla versions of the fancier balls organized in the city, which were attended by the local elite. In place of the lavish dishes used in balls in the city, 
six to six balls featured the kind of food you would find in a mais vendor's basket. Alope, pizzo bitso, baye baye, kalamay hati, and so on. One of the Panay guerrilla officers I interviewed walked from dawn to dusk just to be able to attend a six to six ball, and then walked all the way back to his post when it was over. It was not just the soldiers who exercised a liberal amount of disponeering, as Pestanio Jacinto articulated in her work. War is hardest on those who had the most or the best. Evacuees from Iloilo City, many of them coming from the prominent families, the ones, you know, the ones who owned vast tracts of land or factories before the war ripped them away from them. Well, they were also trying to restore their old guilty pleasures from before the war. This could be read as a way for them to acquire some semblance of normalcy in their lives by replacing the things they were used to with more modest counterparts. They were able to enjoy what one of my informants called an ersatz lifestyle. In place of castañas or chestnuts, coconut meat was roasted. In place of coffee, rice or corn were roasted and then placed in boiling water. For tea, they boiled mango or avocado leaves. As cigars, they rolled papaya leaves on newspaper, which were, on some occasions, Japanese propaganda. For wine, they relied on the trusty tuba, or they manufactured alcoholic beverages from rice. For reading material, the rich would make arrangements with people who could write well to gather intel from the bamboo telegraph, that's chismis, and turn these into newsletters which would serve as reading material. You could probably then imagine going to a remote evacuation site and the first thing that would greet you is a gentleman from the city wearing a nice suit and a hat with a cane by his side, his legs stretched out, reading one of these newspapers, holding a cigar made of papaya leaves with boiled mango as tea. On one occasion, evacuees from the city had been moaning for a long time about not being able to have a proper shower. Someone from among them managed to, with great effort and many trials, manufacture soap from coconut oil. When this sweet smelling coconut oil soap finally showed signs of bubbling with the same consistency as regular soap, a witness excitedly yelled out, my habon, my habon na. Another bystander who had heard this excited clamor mistook it for an announcement that the Japanese were coming. My hapon, my hapon na. And in a fit of panic, yelled at everyone else to pack their bags and run. And run they did. These examples are almost certainly just a few of the many other unrecorded instances of disponering by Ilongos during the course of the war. For our intents and purposes, however, we now ask ourselves what these narratives say to us about our history, and more importantly, how we understand ourselves in the context of the Second World War whenever we recount them. It may be rather unconventional of me, but perhaps the best way for me to illustrate what such narratives are trying to say about us is by introducing you to a popular joke in Iloilo. This joke involves a lifeboat struggling to stay afloat in shark infested waters. There were six people on this lifeboat, which unfortunately could hold only three. Two were Americans, Two were Japanese and two were Ilongos. It now occurred to the occupants that the only way by which they could survive is if three of them would sacrifice themselves to the sharks. After some discussion, it was agreed that each nationality would have to offer up a martyr. 
the first and most daring, was one of the Americans who stood up and with a yell of long live America, threw himself to the sharks. Not to be outdone, one of the Japanese stood up and cried out a long, glorious banzai and proceeded to do the same. Moments passed, and then more, and then even more. And the two Ilongos still couldn't decide which one of them was going to make the ultimate sacrifice. When the lifeboat dangerously came close to capsizing, one of the Ilongos finally stood up and with a great big mabuhay ang mga Pilipino, shoved the closest foreigner into the shark-infested waters. This humorous anecdote has much to reveal about the way we subscribe to the myth narrative style I mentioned at the start of this lecture. While the two Ilongos exhibited their cowardice, they nevertheless overcame their predicament with a quick-witted play of words, mabuhay ang mga Pilipino. It is a fine example of disponeering at its best. This joke is but one of many other versions, all of them hilarious, some of them involving a tremendous amount of farting. They are always done at the expense of the Filipino character, but the Filipino character either always outperforms the other nationalities or survives them. Where is all this coming from then? To my mind, it is a post-colonial manifestation of our colonial anxieties. In a more globalized world, the Filipino, formerly colonized, always disadvantaged in one way or another, and we have our melodramatic soap operas to thank for in maintaining this perception, the Filipino is first presented as weak or poor, but is then redeemed by a healthy dose of quick wit and resourcefulness. The way the stories are reconstructed, or more appropriately, actually, constructed, always seems to deprive other nationalities of their own creative resourcefulness. What they actually reveal more are the ways by which we understand foreigners. Or, from another angle, they reveal the ways by which we gauge ourselves in opposition to foreigners. We know we can get over the challenges. Somehow, we just keep asserting our disadvantages first. I have been Ompoy Gonzalez of the University of the Philippines, Visayas, and following in the footsteps of many of my informants for this research, a proud member of the country's reserve forces. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. Now for our second speaker for this morning, we have Mr. Modesto Saonoy from the Negros Historical Foundation Incorporated, Bacolod City. Mr. Saonoy is a prolific historian based on Negros Occidental. He has published numerous books and monographs dealing with Negros history. He is considered to be the father of serious, or serious Negros history writing. He has received the Ang Banwahanon Award, the highest distinction that the city government of Bacolod can give to its citizens. Several citations and recognition from various organizations and government institutions. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI conferred in him the knighthood of the Pontifical Equestrian Order of Pope St. Sylvester with the rank of Commander and Great Seal the oldest and most prized of papal awards for his work in the Diocese of Bacolod, especially in his various writings on the history of the church and the parishes, chaplain fees, and Catholic schools. His two editions of Occidental Negros History of the Diocese of Bacolod is the most comprehensive history of the church in the island of Negros. The presentation of the Battle of Patag and Latawan was called from his two-volume Against the Rising Sun, Guerrilla War in Negros Island, 1941 to 1945. He now chairs the Negros Historical Foundation Incorporated, aside from active membership in professional and cultural organizations. 
Once again, Mr. Modesto Saonoy. First of all, let me congratulate the Philippine Veterans Administration Office for initiating this very important event in our history, especially our history of World War II. And to all the participants, I bid you good morning. To start off, let me describe to you the battleground in order you can put in perspective why it was very, very difficult for the Americans and the Filipino forces to subdue the Japanese on the time that was appropriated to them by Operation Plan Victor One. Patag and Tawan are nestled right at the middle of the Mandalagan Marapara and all the way to Silai Mountain Ranges. These two places rises about 600 meters from the shorelines or the, you might say the sea level. Patag and Lantawan at the time was practically denuded because it was a timberland that was given to the American Insular Lumber Company as a forest concession. But despite the removal of the centuries old trees, it was still forested. But the most important of it is that its terrain features are very, very good for defense. There is only one main road from the coast to Patag and then from Patag to Lantawan. Consequently, because of its height on both sides of this road are high cliffs and deep ravines. That's why the Americans called it the Banana Ridge because not only it is narrow, it is very slippery. This is therefore the terrain where the fighting was very, very ferocious and also made it very difficult to dislodge the Japanese by mere bombardment and artillery fires. The Japanese defense force were able to make good use of these obstacles so that the fighting had to be done by the infantry. Patag Alantawan faces the western coast of Negros. Behind it is a very high peak of the mountain ranges and going behind these mountain ranges are high cliffs that goes out into Oriental Negros. But the front, the, the western side, is a, you might call a uh, good ground for movement of vehicles, but it goes up and then it reaches a point where vehicles are no longer good or could make good the movement of troops. Patag on the southern side is bounded by another forest the Mandalagan mountain rains and heavy forests. On its northern side is a very deep cliff also covered by forests. So in other words, north, south, and east of Patag are natural defense positions 
of the Japanese. Three armies fought in Patan. The first, the Japanese brigade, the 77th Brigade under General Takeishi Kuno. And with him were 70,000 infantry troops augmented by survivors of Leyte, the Visayan Sea fighting, the uh, crushed uh, zero planes of the Japanese, and other sur survivors of other units that they were able to find themselves in Patan after joining the retreating forces. Helping the Japanese forces were hundreds of Korean and Chinese conscripts, as well as civilians. Some of them, or most of them, were merchants in Bacolod or in Negros. The American side is the 40th Division and the General Ralph Brush. The division of three regiments. It was later augmented by the 503rd Regimental Combat Team. This uh, 503rd uh, is the unit that uh, liberated Corredor. And then the other force composed of Filipinos guerrillas who were constituted as the 7th Military District. After the war, after the have uh, pushed the Japanese forces to Patag, the 7th military, military District units, or the 71st, 72nd, and 73rd infantry divisions were reorganized and placed into battalion combat teams under the direction our leadership of the Americans. It's therefore a conflict, Patag and Lantawan, therefore is a conflict not only of three armies, Filipino, Japanese, and Americans, but also a, survive, a fight for survival of the civilians. Because it was an attack of a Swarsi large force, all the civilians, Filipino civilians, were dislodged from Patag. The Japanese had only infantry weapons. They had no artillery and they had no air force. The Americans, however, were completely equipped. They have the uh, 13th US Air Force, they have all the tanks, they have all the artillery, they have bulldozers and graders, they have all the trucks and jeeps. But one thing that is missing in this well-equipped American force is that they have no cargo carriers. And this is where the Filipinos were made use of initially in the Battle of Patag. They were the ones that hauled supplies all the way up into the mountainsides and into even climbing the cliffs in order to supply the American forces that had been trapped in some of the places of the mountainside. The opposing forces, the three opposing forces, found themselves in a situation where the battle was defined not so much by the men who fought it, but rather by the terrain. It was good for the Japanese, it was very bad for the Americans and the Filipinos. <laughs>
How come that Patag and Latawan became the focal point? How come that it became the place where the, the Japanese converged for the last fight in Negros? The 77th Brigade, as you may have, have under General Connie, were actually from Iloilo, from Padang. At the beginning of the war and throughout the period of the occupation in 1943 and the middle at the early part of 1944, there were only 400 Japanese soldiers in Negros. But when the Battle of Patag began, it increased tremendously because of the augmentation. But most importantly is the prelude of this battle that made it possible for the Americans and the Filipinos to canalize, as so to say, to force the Japanese into a pocket. The war that the Americans fought in Negros began not on their landing on March 29, but rather on the first day of March of 1945. On orders of the 8th Army, the Filipino guerrillas were told to force the Japanese to retreat towards Patag. In truth, Filipino guerrillas have already reported to American authorities that the Japanese are building up a defense position in Patag and Latawan. And so the Americans believe that Latawan and Patag will become the major battleground. The Japanese were scattered all over the island of Negros, but the oriental side is not under the west, the 77th Brigade, but it's under Cebu. So the ones under Kono were the one were the units that had to fight in Negros. Those in Cebu did not fight in Negros. In fact, they were not able to fight at all because they surrendered before they could even fight. So anyway, that's a story for another uh, uh, chapter in uh, the history of the war in Negros. In Negros, the Japanese were scattered northeast all the way to the south of Negros in several garrisons. The Americans directed the 7th Military District to, be, to initiate attacking the Japanese garrisons and to force them into the pocket. And to a certain extent, the Japanese obliged because they have nowhere else to go. And in a way, they have already prepared their positions in Patag. When the Filipino guerrillas started attacking, the tactic that is used by, by the Japanese was to move backwards or retreat slowly, slowly. So it was more of a delayed action rather than a fight to the death. The only real battle outside of Patag was in the south because the Japanese forces in the south, especially Himamailan, Pinalbagan, and Potamidra fought very, very uh, well to the point that it did delay the advance of the Filipinos. But eventually they gave way. And by March 29, when the American forces arrived, the Japanese were already in Patan, but they had rear guards, the intent of which is to delay the American advance. 
And so they were fighting. Therefore, from, Binalba, from Imam Island, Agisan, Arbin Albagan, and then from San Carlos, all the way, and the Japanese were eventually forced to retreat towards Patang and Latawan. The initial, the initial, uh, or the forward defense position of the Japanese were from Bacolod to Victorias. But this was not held strongly. The, the Japanese here were not able to construct uh, defensive position. They were more of foxholes. They were more of uh, running battle and, of course, night attacks. One of the failures of the Japanese was that they were unable to mine the bridges. They were prepared for mining. They were prepared for explosions, but they uh, failed to put in explosives because the explosives that were intended to be put in these bridges were intercepted by the Filipinos and the Americans in Pulau Pandan. And so all the bridges, north and south, were open, and this speeded up the uh, American advance. That by the 5th of April, they were already in the forward defense position of General Kuro. And here the battle became more intense. But again, the Japanese gave way. They could not resist the impact. The positioning of the um, Japanese uh, was west of Patag Alantau, that means towards the west. And General Brush put in three of his regiments abreast, attacking from the west, north, southwest, west, center, and northwest of Patang and Latawan, and then moved in to converge into the Patang Valley. When the Americans reached the attack valley, valley facing the Patang and the Tawan, that is when the forward elements, the forward position, defense position of Kono was established. And here the fighting became, became very, very, very deadly and very, very slow. The Americans made good use of aerial and artillery fires. They could make use of uh, naval guns because they're too far away from the shorelines. The shorelines are about 60 kilometers away to the west. And so the Americans were bombing the Japanese position from early morning up to five o'clock. The Japanese uh, uh, diary, a diary of the Japanese captain that was captured wrote that the Americans considered the war like going to the office. They started bombing at 8 o'clock in the morning and then stopped at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The same thing with their artillery. So the Japanese could anticipate when the bombing and when the artillery bombardment or barrage would occur. So the defensive position of the, of the uh, Japanese were very clever. Knowing that the forward positions are exposed and they have not, and they have no way of stopping artillery and bombing, they dug trenches on the reverse slope of Patan and Lantawan. So the American bombings and artillery would hit the forward slope, when the Japanese are hiding 
on the reverse slope of the mountains. When the Japanese, or rather when the American guns and bombs are lifted, then that's when they come out and move forward. And this what made the fighting more difficult because by the time the artillery uh, barrage are lifted or the planes have left, that is when the infantry would move forward only to meet a very heavy opposition. The Battle of the Ridges, therefore, was a very slow, painful, and to the Americans, a very expensive in terms of loss of life. The same thing with the Filipinos. The bombings and the artillery barrage as well as close-in fighting but also very expensive in terms of life for the Japanese. A captured document of, of a Japanese soldier said that this, although they were in the tunnels, and in the trenches, the psychological impact of the guns and the bombs had exact, extracted a very heavy tool on the Japanese. Many could not bear the bombing, and many incidents of suicide were recorded. And so the fighting continued. The two ridges, hill, hill in Patag, and other hill in Lentawan. Hill four o five three five four o five three is in. Patag and Hill 3155 is Latawa. The Americans positioned the 503rd not directly in front but rather on the right flank of the Japanese defensive position. And in that sense, General Jones or Colonel Jones at the time was able to dislodge the Japanese from Hill. 4053 through a flanking attack. In other words, is the front, instead of attacking the front of the Japanese, Colonel Jones attacked on the right flank and therefore was able to penetrate the Japanese much further. And the Japanese had to let go of 4053. Five, three. And with that, the Japanese had to retreat and hold on to 3155. It's a little bit lower than Patan. And so they could be seen from the top. But it is more treacherous in terms of its accessibility because it's a stiff. And not only stiff, it is very, very good for the defenders. The defenders could see the Americans crawling forward. And because by the time it was already the rainy season, it was very difficult for the Americans to crawl up. The bombings as well as the cutting of the trees by the Insular Lumber Company had caused the erosion of the 
sides of the mountains and crawling up was very difficult to the point that the Americans could not climb. And so what did they do? They asked the Filipinos to move forward. The Filipinos simply removed their shoes so they were able to bring not only, not only to go up and to reinforce but also to bring in supplies to the Americans that were trapped in the upper portion of Hill 3155. But eventually, the Americans were able to prevail by attrition. But the Battle of Patag and Atawan, according to Victor, Operation Plan Victor 1, is supposed to be completed by May, end of May. But by end of May, they were just halfway of the objectives. To the point that General MacArthur was concerned about the development because the 14th Division and the Filipino Division, the military districts, were supposed to be retrained in order to be deployed eventually in the planned invasion of Japan. In fact, MacArthur could not wait. And by the middle of May, one of the uh, regiments or the 5 or 30, 160th, was withdrawn already from the battlefield. But by this time, the 5 or 30 were already, already taken over the uh, Japanese position in Hill. 4053. When the Japanese remained adamant, resistant, Brush was forced not only to get one regiment of the 7th military district, but to withdraw all of them from the field and from training and use them for the final assault of Patag and the Tawan. But by the time, Patag had already been subdued and the final obstacle was 3155. And here, the battle, the close in combat was the most intense of all. In fact, it is so intense and so difficult for the Americans that man-to-man -man combat had to be resorted and uh, a Congressional Medal of Honor was won there by Sergeant John Shugrin. Uh, that will, we don't have much time to discuss, but it's a very, it's a, uh, it's a story that uh, should go into, into the movies of how Shugrin was able to overcome the forward elements of the Japanese position in Hill 3155. The persistent defense of General Kono forced General MacArthur, after visiting the uh, Patag, well, specifically Lantawa, uh, forced him to order the removal of the 40th Division, the entire division, and to replace it with the entire Filipino Division, the 73rd and part of 74th Division of the 7th Military District. And the war by the time, however, the uh, MacArthur must have already sensed that the fighting capability of the Japanese have already died down. And it's a question of following up, of mopping up, as it were. The only remaining obstacle was Hill 
3155. And the Japanese were the trap there. The major obstacle of General Kono was no longer the Americans alone, but hunger, disease, and mental torture of his troops. The dead and the dying were multiplied. Many of the dead were from suicide, from disease, and from hunger. And so it is that when he was captured, or rather when he surrendered, and he was interviewed, General Koro said, they have decided to fight to the death. They knew that they have no way out. They could not retreat to the east. They have to face the west and the north. He actually planned to go to the south. After he abandoned Hill 4053, and retrenched himself in Hill 3155, he intended to go and to escape south and to join the forces in the Gross Oriental. But he was also blockaded there in Borsia, which is gateway towards the south, by another unit of the 7th Military District. But he had no choice, he had to go. But as we know, by August 15, Japan surrendered. And two days later, uh, Colonel Joe S. Lowry, who replaced Colonel Jones, sent out fillers and drop leaflets in the mountains telling Kono that Japan has surrendered and he will await for the representative of General Kori, Kono, to discuss the terms of surrender. By this time, Colonel Jones had been also relieved and given his, uh, what do call it, vacation in the United States because he had been constantly in war for three years. So eventually, Kono surrendered. <clears throat> As you can see, the number of his uh, troops that surrendered There in the PowerPoint, you can see the uh, number of those who surrendered. After Kono was torn over his samurai, he collapsed and he was rushed to Bacolod, where he was resuscitated in the Sibris Hotel, which was converted to a hospital. Eventually, he was sent to Manila and then tried in the Manila War Crimes Tribunal and executed. And so ended the Battle of Patan and Lantawan. This battle is the worst that had been fought in this island and it's the most costly in terms of life of all parties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Saonori. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where our morning session ends. The afternoon session will proceed at exactly 12.30 p.m.
While waiting, let us give you a virtual tour of our National Military Shrine. 